Hi, my name is uh, Etienne Bernard, and uh, I will talk about uh, uh, building the automated data scientist, the new version of Classify and Predict. So it's about uh, the improvement of Classify and Predict that we did for version 11.2, and uh, how we did a, a new automation system for these functions. Hey everyone. So today I'm going to talk about the, the new version of Classify and Predict in uh, 11.2 and uh, how they relate to kind of broader goal of creating an automated data scientist. Okay, so first, um, what do we have in mind when, when I say automated data scientist? Well, so let, let's see an example. An example that I like is um, an owner of a, a small business, let's say a bakery. And, um, and one day, this person decided to plug um, data scientist software um, on database of, 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 of the business and uh, start asking questions, such as, how many croissants are we going to sell next Sunday? And, uh, and the system would answer, well, according to your recorded data and some other factors, such as the weather, uh, there is 90% of chance that between 62 and 67 croissants will be sold. Okay? So really a system, what I have in mind is a system that you can throw any data at, it will understand what's going on, and then you can have a conversation with. And you'll get insight from, uh, from, from this data. So, of course, there are many parts that are important in order to achieve such a system. Uh, one of them is understanding uh, the question of the human, okay? In that case, natural language. Uh, in that case, given natural language. Another one is understanding the data that is given because they can be in various formats. They can be, like, you have these strings. You have to know, is it a date? Is it a city? Is it, you know, you have to understand this. Um, the ability to access external data, also I think it's very important. In that case, it would be the weather that is probably not in database of the, of, uh, of the business. And, um, and then, of course, it's about automatically uh, uh, creating a model that will be able to predict uh, what's going to happen in the future in that case. Okay, that's an automatic modeling part. And, uh, and then, of course, communicating the result back. Uh, to the human. And um, actually, many of these parts are worked on in, in, uh, at Wolfram, like in the, in the company, um, uh, in various groups. For example, the human understanding, uh, the accessing external data, and the communicating result back are really the, the core job of Wolfram Alpha. Okay? Uh, that understanding, we, we, we try to do things. There's been, like, for example, semantic import is something that can uh, import data and, and try to understand what it is and interpret it. Um, although I think we should work more in this, uh, in this direction because it's probably the, the part that we have the most missing uh, technology. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is the automatic modeling part. Okay, the machine learning part. So this automatically modeling is a job of classify and predict which are the first machine learning function that we put in the language in version 10, three years ago. And um, so, it's, uh, so it's automatic modeling, as I was saying, automatic functions, um, and it's supervised learning, meaning that it learns how to predict an output from examples of input-output. Okay, very broadly speaking, it learns a function. For example, here, um, there's four examples. The inputs are just a numeric input, okay? which can be one, two, three, four here. And uh, the output is, is a category, a class. Here is A or B. And uh, the function takes on these examples and learns how to uh, predict the output for a new input. So it tries to generalize. So in that example, it's, it's uh, pretty simple. If I put 1.6, well, given one is A and two is A, 1.6 is probably B A. And uh, you can also ask for probabilities. So, okay, that, it's a very toy example. There's only four uh, data set of, of length four. So, of course, here the probability, uh, it's completely sure it's A um, in that case. And uh, there is a similar function called predict, which is basically the same, except that the output is a numerical value now. 
So let's put some, I don't know. Let's do something more or less linear just for understanding the results. Uh, something like that. Okay? So it will, uh, it will create a predictor function that then we can use again. So here, 1 is 1.2, 2 is 3.2, so okay, 1.6, probably between, okay, 3. Point, oh, actually, actually, it's above 2. wonder why. Um, and uh, I can again ask for the probabilities, but this time it's a, it's a continuous variable, so it's not probabilities, but a distribution. Okay. Actually, maybe some people don't see the back. Let me put this like this. Better. <laughs> and um, okay, that's the idea. And as you, as you have seen, I didn't put a method, or I didn't say, oh, this was a numerical variable and not a nominal variable. Or I didn't give any instruction. I just say, here is the data. Find a way to, to model it. That's why we say they are automatic. And, uh, and the input can be, so it's just a numeric, but it can be also nominal values, it can be images, it can be text, it can be sound. And, uh, and uh, actually one of our, of our work is to try to improve the possibilities. So it can be a combination of all the, the, the types that I just uh, mentioned as well. Um, okay, that's what classify and predict are about. And uh, now I'm going to talk about what changed, what's new in 11.2. So I assume you, I mean, probably many of you know a bit this function. So uh, the main thing that changed, at least, that, that you can see when you use it, is that now there's a training progress panel that is displayed during the training. So to illustrate this, I'm, I'm grabbing a very classic data set in machine learning, uh, which is MNIST, it's n written digits. Okay, I'm taking it from our uh, resource data. We, we have a data repository, we, we put data sets. Uh, we have to put more for machine learning, by the way. And, uh, <laughs> And, uh, okay, so this is a bunch of, of um, okay, and written digits, okay? Very classic. And before, if I was just running classify on this, what would happen? It would just, you know, mark itself as evaluating, and then you would just wait and hope that it finishes, uh, you know, before you're bored. Uh, otherwise, you have, you know, you just cancel and you lost everything. Uh, but now, it's a bit different. Now, as you'll see, there is this uh, panel. Oh, it has trouble in, um, in presentation mode. That's interesting. Well, we discover bugs even while presenting. <laughs> so actually, let, let me go not in presentation mode just to, to show this. So, working, okay, let's try again. Okay, so you can see this, this uh, information panel about how, what's happening in the, in the training. You can see the time elapsed, progress bar, uh, the current method that the system believes is the best, um, and some also the current accuracy that the system managed to achieve or the current value of the loss function. So you can really know what's going on during the, the training, and you can decide to stop at any point. I mean, here it's, it's uh, already about to stop by itself, but. Um, Let's do it again, actually, to make it longer. I'm going to use a time goal option. I'm going to tell you about this option just after. I say one minute, then we are, we'll be fine. Uh, and, um, oh yeah, so you can also switch uh, panels. So here we'll show you the, the current accuracy uh, as function of the training side that the system tested. So the system does many experiments. It says, oh, let's try with 50 examples. Let's try with 100 examples and with this method. And let's try so a bunch of experiments. And here it's kind of a way for you to visualize the results of these experiments. Um, that's what we call a, a learning curve. Um, actually, sorry, I, I, was, I was on the stop button before. Let me go back on the learning curve. Uh, so yeah, you have a stop button. So at any moment, you can click the stop button. Okay, and it will stop. But fortunately, it won't lose everything like before it will grab the best model so far that it managed to obtain and return it. And you see there was a bit of delay when I press the stop button because it's kind of finishing what it's doing. Uh, if you want even more abrupt ending, you just abort the evaluation and it will still return what it has so far, but by aborting absolutely everything. So if I do abort, I have it directly. 
Okay, good question. Good question, okay, okay. So, um, okay, so let me go on the, on, the, on the time goal first, what it is. So it's an option to really indicate uh, the, the, the function, how long it should spend training. It's not a time constraint. It's not like don't train more than this amount. This amount. It's really a goal that should be reached, which can be really useful if you have you know, 10 hours ahead of you, like, I don't know, you go to bed, you say, okay, I put 10 hours. So you can put a number of seconds, or you can put, you know, classic in Mathematica, uh, if I put, uh, I don't know, one minute, and this will, uh, th this will work as well. And um, the automatic is a really interesting thing that I think, okay, I can start giving an explanation and maybe I can talk more after. Um, it, this system by doing experiment is always trying to predict how well it would perform, how it would perform on the full data set. So try to predict from the experiment, oh, probably this method is the best, and how long would this method take on the full data set? So it does this estimation, and it tries to only train, let's say, one configuration, so one method and a parameter, on the full data set. That's kind of the, the, the principle of the system. Uh, if you set different performance goals, maybe we'll try in two or three, but, but it's like a small amount on the full data set, and a lot of experiments before. But of course, it's always a bit wrong in the prediction that it does on the full data set. So it kind of, comes back, you know, um, um, maybe I can, okay, maybe I can start telling, telling about that. So let, let's put in um, normal mode, like without, without a time goal. And I'm going to directly to the last view that shows all the experiments that are done. Okay, and you see that sometimes it will, in order to grab more information, it will give a larger data set, sometimes just to have a good information about how long we have, and this will influence how long we will spend in the, in the earlier stage. Because if you know you're going to spend a lot of time to train the final thing, you know that you have enough time to do a lot of experiments. So there's kind of an interaction between getting more knowledge and then, um, so, okay. And so you have these learning curves um, that are very important because um, they can, they can, actually, let me talk about that in the classifier information. So we changed also classifier information to have a similar panel. So I just do classifier information of the classifier. And this returns, a, so you see a very similar panel. And um, so you have access to, okay, so the type of the data, number of class, the method, including its, its uh, hyperparameters, um, the believed accuracy that the, that the uh, classifier has uh, on a test set, so by, because it, it tests itself on test sets, and uh, the, the loss, the time it takes to evaluate an example, the memory of the classifier, you know, th things like this, and these learning curves, which are very important because they can help you decide if you should get more data or not. And for example, in that case, it's clearly going down, the loss function. So it's clear that with more data, we'll get a better classifier. And often getting data is expensive. So, so it's important, like if, if the learning curve is plateauing, uh, uh, it's important to know it in order not to spend a lot of time getting more data, whereas there was just not enough information in the features that you're using, for example. Or maybe you, your model was, is not good enough, but it's not the data as a bottleneck. Something else that has to change. That's, that's very important. You can set it with the learning curve, you can set it with the accuracy. Um, I mean, learning curve is the, the, the loss, right? Uh, we also pay attention to the error bars because sometimes you have the feeling is going down, but actually the error bars are. Uh, but in that case, it's clear we need, we need more data. So, yeah, so that, that's the main changes. Like the, the, oh, one thing I should mention just there is that this panel, you can also control it with the function training progress reporting. So, for example, you can just remove it which kind of what would have happened before. Classify would just be like this, okay? But it's useful when you use it inside another function and you don't want many things appear and so on, you know? Um, or you can, if you, if you work like on a standalone kernel, like in a, you know, in a shell with, with a command line, uh, you can just do print. And like if you have no front end, basically, you can do print and it will print the same information, but this time just a, a stupid print. Um, which, by the way, this, uh, so you, you've seen similar panel in, uh, in the NetTrain, probably. 
And uh, we hope that this, um, this idea of having an evaluation panel will kind of spread in the language. Uh, I can think of optimization function that might use it, you know, and, and uh, it might be nice to see the evolution and, and stopping the optimization whenever we want. Or maybe there's some others. Uh, uh, so we, yeah. How did we create this panel? Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, I mean, this is something we created from scratch, like it's a, it's a grid inside. We have, we have an own utility function to do, to do this. And um, yeah, no, it's not using like monitor progress like, like the, the, the thing that were before. I, I hope so, I hope so, yes. I mean, it, it seems like the type of problem where a panel could be, could be there. So, so yeah, uh, I hope so. I mean, I'm not in charge of this function, so we should discuss uh, people that are, but, but uh, if it's possible, it's always complicated when you use external libraries and so on, uh, but if there's a way from the external library to kind of grab the state of, of things that are, that are going on, which, which might make sense, you know, optimization function. I can't believe that you have an external library that doesn't give you anything. So, uh, I guess so. Yeah. So, so actually, this is in terms of, of timing. So, this is a test set that is created during the, the training, and um, there's like some sort of time constraints. Uh, I think the heuristic is that it should not spend more than 20% of amount of time to test. Uh, so. So there's a lot of, yeah, this type of automation inside to be sure that nothing goes crazy because sometimes you have a method that can take a very long time to test, like nearest neighbor. Nearest neighbor is very fast to train. You don't do anything, basically. But to test, uh, might be depending on the number of dimension and so on, can be slow. So these sort of things to, yeah. And, and it's like the test as large as possible, as long as I spend less than 20% of time that I spend training. That's basically what it, what it is. That's why sometimes you'll get very small, so this is a statistical error because of the size of the test set. Sometimes you get a small one, sometimes you get a big one. Well, you don't have really a control. In order to have a control on your test set, you can use classifier measurements. So, so actually, hopefully this will reduce the need of classifier measurements because sometimes that's good enough. You know, you have the accuracy, you have the learning curve. Let's move on. Uh, but if you want to be more, more precise, control exactly what's going on, uh, use classifier measurements. Okay, so just to continue, um, yeah, I guess I can continue on this thing. So uh, there's also been some, some news on the, on the methods. Um, so, okay, an important thing is that all the methods are documented now. So if we go, for example, I don't know, linear regression, probably the first thing we did, oh, it doesn't find it, there's two S. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and um, so, yeah, now, now there is, there is, a, there is a documentation with, with some examples. More importantly, uh, a bit how, how the method works. And uh, more importantly, the sub options, I mean, the options you can use uh, when indicated this, uh, this method. So you can say, you know, something like classify. Um, okay, your data, whatever, method goes to, oh, actually it auto, let's say logistic regression. And then you can also specify, this is a classic uh, syntax, classic design, uh, like op optimization function use the same type of thing, for, for example. You can put some sub-options. For example, here it can be L2 regularization goes to five. And uh, here you can get the list of the possible, uh, that bigger. There's a list of the possible sub option you can use. So, so it's going a bit away from the full automation, uh, but I think experts will be happy to have, to have this control uh, over, over the methods. Okay, and then you have new method, decision tree, very classic method. Uh, actually, you know what, we could, we could explore them. Decision tree, here you go, it's there. Very classic method. Uh, and gradient boosted tree, which is 
uh, we see trees, so it's like a mini tree. It's, it's a forest that you're constructing, um, a bit similar to random forest, but, but with some, some differences, which is a, a method that data scientists uh, like a lot. Uh, on Kaggle, many competitions are won with this, with this method. Um, so we added it. Um, although it's a method that is a bit harder to automatize, uh, because as you see, there's a lot of uh, upper parameters that have, been, that have to be determined automatically. Um, so often, Roland Forest actually performs better just because in full automation mode. Uh, but maybe if you spend some time, a uh, lot of time, you'll end up with a grain boosted tree that is better. And we improved some, some methods, such as a neural network. Now, use our neural network framework. Before, it was kind of our primitive framework that we had at the time. Um, and also, linear regression and logistic regression has been, have been improved. And uh, yeah. Neural network is, yeah, is an interesting one because it's not trivial to uh, automatize uh, neural network. Like you have a whole structure to determine automatically. Uh, that is quite complex, uh, but we think there's a lot of power in it. And, and when we'll manage to do that well, uh, we, it can to never be fast training, but in some cases we can get very high performance by having an automatic network. So it's a bit, it's kind of a research area actually that, that we are going into. Um, so. So if you see crazy results with the current neural network, uh, uh, it's also because uh, in, the, in the current version, uh, it's also because it's, it's very hard to automatize this thing. But actually, we'd love to get your feedback. Like, we did a lot of work on that. We know that it's highly experimental, but please use this method and tell us if it worked or not. Yeah? No, so, so, so this function are only one output. One so if you have two output, you have two, two classifiers, and then there will be all, all in your own network. Yes, 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 yes. Definitely we would want to have predict, to be generalized, to predict anything, and including image and text and so on. Uh, but this is a rather big work, as you, as you can imagine, uh, but that's something we want to tackle soon. Um, it's probably one function we wanted before, learn this, I mean, okay. Let's not go in <laughs> plan, but yeah, that's something we want to do. Okay, so maybe I can uh, still have a few minutes, so let me just talk a bit about what's under the hood. And um, so it's really a new automation procedure that enabled all this change. So it's actually the, 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 the reason we, we decided to, do, to change classify and predict uh, was first to change the automation procedure and then realized that this new automation procedure could give a lot of benefits, such as uh, the progress panel, the possibility to interrupt and, and uh, end um, the, the yeah, progress bar, time goal, um, the performance optimization, and the learning curves. So we're really happy to find a nice automation procedure that is faster than before, but also gives all this, uh, all this positive side effect, I should say. I guess side effect is sometimes badly connoted. Okay, so just to tell you a little bit how it works. The idea is to start with an initial set of configuration that we believe would perform not too bad. So the beginning is kind of an heuristics as, as it was before. Okay, it's like, okay, let's say one read configuration that could perform well. But then we're going to start training these configurations, but not on the full data set because it would be too slow. So we train it on, on restricted data sets that are pretty small and it would be fast to train. So I call these experiments. So we do these experiments, I told you a little bit before, and, uh, and then we measure how well this thing performed, how fast they were to train, what is its memory, and so on. And we try to predict how well they would perform on the full data set. That's, that's the hard part. It's like you see a configuration that trained that has this performance with 100 example, this performance with 500 example, how well would it perform on 10,000 examples? Of course, the predictions are very uncertain, but still, there's some information there. And so we leverage this information in order to give priority to configuration that have potential, that, that have a higher chance of performing well on the full data set. And so we give them more data, then we grab more information, then we redo the predictions, new selection, and so on. Okay, so it's a continuous process, and just let me show you in action. I showed you a little bit already, but 
Um, let's do let's do a time goal. Then we'll have time to talk about it. Sorry, not C. It's uh, MNIST, I think. Why is it all blurry? Okay. And uh, okay, let, let's run this. And you can see on this last panel, it's the learning curve for all the configurations. By the way, configuration, it's like both the method and the options of the method, the hyperparameters. That's what I call a configuration. So each of these lines represents a configuration that has been trained on values data set size. And you can see here the system that does experiments, you know, try on larger data set, then come back to smaller data set because it realized, oh, actually, I have time. I can do things with more experiments on a smaller data set. And, and, um, and uh, so it's, it's a bit of an exploration procedure, but I try to be a bit smart on which, which example. So for example, this one was apparently nearest neighbor pretty good, so it's already trained on the full data set. Still, since I put 60 seconds, it still have time to do some more experiments just in case there was one that, that is better. Um, yeah, so, so here it is. And, and an important thing to understand is that because the training times of MOF method are at least linear, okay, when I double the size of data set, it's at least twice faster to train, maybe except nearest neighbor, although there's some pre-processing, so it might also be true of, of nearest neighbor. It means that the experiments are pretty cheap. That if we are multiplying by a constant, you know, we, 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 we explore the training set size in a geometric way, um, um, we can do a lot of experiments on small data sets for nothing. And the whole question is how much information do they give? Right? They're really cheap to do, they're done perfect information, but still information there. And, and that, that's what we leverage to, to get something uh, faster. Okay, so I was saying that that's everything that this new procedure brings. And uh, now, what could we do for the future of this procedure? Um, one thing would be to include, you know, you know the, to have a configuration not be just a method and hyperparameters, but also include the preprocessing. To say, oh, let's try this preprocessing, this method, this hyperparameter, or this other preprocessing, this other method, this other hyperparameter. Because currently it's kind of separated, it's processing automatic with another method, and then uh, this. So this, this would be great to do that, to be able to combine methods. Maybe, oh, actually, let's do a neural network on this image, and let's do, uh, a, a, I don't know, random forest on this other data, and then let's gather the result. This is something that currently we, we don't do, but I hope we will. And then there is, um, um, uh, in order to, to guide us in this uh, automatic, uh, for us, for developers, is to gather many data sets and, and do experiments on many data sets um, um, in, order, in a way to, to learn from these data sets how to learn on a future data set. That's why it's called learning to learn or, or, or meta-learning. That's something that we're very excited about and we already start gathering data sets and hopefully we can do something uh, uh, useful soon. Okay, thank you. I think I'm over time. <laughs>